are some exciting options coming up in the future for that, but we've used them for everything from a normal house fire to be able to, especially with the thermal imaging camera, see uh, the structural integrity of the building before we commit firefighters in, um, up to uh, tracking the firefighters on scene. We've used it with law enforcement for missing persons, for uh, dangerous subjects that have, have run. Um, and we've done a lot of practice and training for, unfortunately, uh, active shooter events and being able to fly indoors to assist tactical teams indoors. Um, but there's also a lot that, that I've looked at recently we call our, I, I've called the passive rescues. Uh, times when we rescued lives that we never knew, um, and that is uh, on the law enforcement side, I've seen several scenarios where officers have been able to uh, detain a subject where they're at their most calm and comfortable, and the officers are as well, and no officer has had to draw a weapon um, and had to engage a subject. And that's been, that I think to me is one of those, those, those rescues that we're making that we don't even realize or know about is, is the great opportunity. And we can't quantify those because we don't really realize we just did that. Right, right, thank you. And I, I wanna switch gears with you, Rob, because you have a background in using drones with agriculture. And I don't think a lot of people maybe rec recognize how extensively drones are being used in agriculture as well as the opportunity. So why don't you just share with the audience how drones are being used in agriculture? Uh, sure. So. The, uh, the way that drones are being used in agriculture is it, certainly in our use case, we're using drones for um, precision, you know, you know uh, management of, of agriculture. Um, so in the case of being able to monitor uh, crops for, for stress um, uh, and uh, water content and being able to, to target the way that you apply, apply your, your chemical treatments and, and your watering to, to do that in a way that's a bit more efficient than um, than, than it could be done otherwise. Um, that said, you know, certainly there's a lot of farmers around the, uh, around the country and around the world that, that are, you know, use these techniques uh, in other ways you know, that are just not as um, efficient as, as what drones can bring to the table. So uh, the, the, the upshot of using a drone is that you can use, you can have this, this resource that is able to very quickly, you know, gather data and, and collect it in a way and put it in, into a package that is, uh, can be consumed uh, a lot more easily than it would be than just going out and walking your fields. So. Thank you. If I could steal from that. Yeah, absolutely. I actually was taking some of their agricultural uses and looking at fuel moisture content of our uh, wildland fuels. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and earlier this year, we were able to determine when the fuels were okay and, and we could do something like a 4th of July fireworks event. And then a few weeks later, where it had dried out enough that we were instituting burn bans in our area, um, using a lot of what, just taking their, their uses and turning it into a good for ours as well. So. That's great. Thank you for so. adding that. So uh, continuing on the line of applications and in industry, you know, Melissa, what I find interesting is use of drones and insurance. Now, State Farm is a 100-year-old company, right? Almost. Plus, right, <laughs> right at 100. And usually when we're thinking about drones, we're thinking more tech companies, industries, or uh, organizations that are much younger than 100 years old. So why don't you share with us how a 100-year-old company is integrating drones into their workflow? Yeah, that's a great question. So it can be difficult to integrate new technology in a 100-year-old company because you can imagine the processes and procedures and technology that's well established once you're that old. But the great news is State Farm was an innovative company from the very beginning, much like a lot of the startups here at CES. Our founder had a problem and sought to solve it, and that's how we started. And so that entrepreneurial spirit is something that we work very hard to continue at State Farm. And our, our chairman's council, our CEO, wants to keep that alive in State Farm and has made an intentional investment. And the department I'm in, Labs, is our research and development arm of State Farm. And so we work hard in looking at what are the new technologies coming out, what are the problems that are out there. And five years ago, we started our drone research. And 
first it was just w what are drones, how do you operate them, what are the regulations around them, and through that we've had this journey where we implemented roof inspections in our claims um, department, we've implemented being able to fly with the first um, BV loss and ops over people waivers after catastrophes, and my team is looking at what else beyond claims can we do with flying with our BV loss and ops over people waiver, and how do we do predictive modeling and simulations so that we can help people and help communities understand what risks are present and help prevent that risk. And that's really the core of what we want to do. That's, that's great. And again, just having to have a background in insurance, to, to uh, think ahead now of how insurance companies are incorporated, I, I think is great. So Jay, I want to go back to you once again, drones in the, in the media. Uh, most recently here at CES, there's a conversation around urban air mobility. Oh, yes. And specifically around here in the United States, you know, testing that's going on. What, is the biggest, what, is, what are the biggest challenges and how soon do you really see this becoming reality for us here in the States? So the biggest challenge for urban air mobility is the same large challenge and the, the, the thing we work hardest on in small drones. And that really is community acceptance. Um, <clears throat> without the community understanding the operations, without the community being fully informed and engaged, uh, they, they tend to resist. And with urban air mobility, we will now be introducing aircraft into urban environments where th they are already sensitive to noise, privacy, and other issues well beyond aviation safety, which is our mission in the FAA. And we need to work together with those operators, those manufacturers, and those local communities all as, an, as a united ecosystem to bring these operations forward. And there's a, a tremendous discussion we had yesterday where um, some input from cities like Los Angeles and Denver talking about their need to build the infrastructure. But it's, it's not just building the infrastructure, it's the community believing that that infrastructure and those operations are truly benefiting the whole community. And I want to compliment um, companies like here and specifically State Farm and they're a great example of a non-aviation company who learned to not only just fly these things but developed a whole aviation safety culture. Um, they work great with their communities. I mean, I think it's sort of a core business of the insurance company to work with a community. But we've got others, our, our package delivery companies and others have been seeing how valuable it is to go out and talk to folks. Why are these drones over my house? What are they doing? Why am I, how are they benefiting me? And once the community gets involved and understands that, they accept it, they promote it, and they're, they're very willing to engage. And we see the same need with urban air mobility. Most likely, we will see um, cargo missions even before human transport. Um, obviously, cargo doesn't complain about the ride. Um, and so it's a little bit easier to work out business models and concepts with cargo. We currently have over six projects well into aircraft certification. And so we are about to see the airplanes that will be capable of these missions emerge. Um, according to these companies, they want to begin initial trial operations around 2024, and we've seen goals of routine operation around 2028, and we're ready to work with them. We're already working with them on uh, certification and operations, and w the good news is, much like the drones, we also believe that our current regulatory uh, framework can be adapted to permit these operations and move them forward. And so we want to take that same operations first, learn, do more complex operations, and continue on with them, just as we've done successfully with the small drones. So given that, being of age where I remember watching George Jetson. Oh, you have to put $20 in my little jar. <laughs> Anyone who says that, I make them put $20, and we're going to contribute <laughs> it. it to a good cause. You got it. But given the George Jess Jetson concept, and his dog, Elroy, and his wife, Jane. You know, daughter, how, Judy. And daughter, Jane, very good, Jane's so you're wife. in that same group. How soon would you just speculate that we might see passenger drones uh, as a reality in one of our cities? 
So my corporate answer is as soon as it's safe. <laughs> um, and ba but based on what industry is working towards, certainly within this decade. Okay. Um, there's some different viewpoints as to whether it will be a premium service first or how quickly will they be able to drive the cost down. And I think there's a lot to be worked out there um, with their business models and what works for them. Uh, but we've already got um, a well-known ride-sharing company that is practicing with a Part 135, an on-demand air carrier that's a current helicopter operator in New York. And they're just seeing how does our business model work and how does the whole flow work with our ride sharing? And uh, they're just waiting on an aircraft to be manufactured. I hear they announced something very exciting here at CES. Yes, absolutely. So I want to build upon your comment, though, about public acceptance. And, and Melissa, maybe you can help us with public acceptance at the local level in terms of incorporating drones. You know, you're sending out claims adjusters to the community to inspect roofs and seek out damage. How, how is State Farm going about engaging the public and educating them on the value of utilizing drones rather than sending an adjuster up on the roof, you know, because that's what people are accustomed to. So this is changing not only your business model, but it's also changing perceptions. Mm -hmm. Can you share with us uh, State Farm's approach to engaging the community? Yes, definitely. So first things first, our claims adjusters are still claims adjusters first. So the drone is another tool in their toolbox. So when they're working with customers, they're adjusting the claim, and that's their primary role. Um, the drone is just another tool, um, much like the, the newscasters had talked about in the last session about the drone gives them another t tool to use to get the shot that they need. Um, so our claims adjusters operate similarly. From a customer or a consumer engagement, public engagement standpoint, we are part of the integrated pilot program. And so through that program, we're sharing feedback um, both to the FAA, through our partners at Virginia Tech, through the Mid-Atlantic Aviation Partnership, and then um, through our newsroom, through statefarm.com. Um, we also you know, share press release as we have milestones that we can share. But really one of our first points that you, know, you share is our drone pilots out in the field. And when, when my research team first deployed drone pilots, we, we were a little nervous. We weren't sure how the public was going to react. And it's actually been very positive, much more positive than we were, in, you know, we were initially worried about just given the, the privacy laws and things like that that are being um, debated in, in um, the news and whatnot. So. Um, those drone pilots are the, the first point in contact to a lot of community members. They're reaching out to local authorities, letting them know what we're doing. Um, we also participate with programs like Women in Drones, um, with STEM programs, with local schools and uh, community groups. And we're really just interested in letting the public know that we're operating safely and that the benefits that the drones in, can provide to um, what we're doing and just really in general with lots of different use cases, not just state farms. Great. Thank you. And Rob, as you think about the test site, you all are part of the uh, UAS test sites, maybe you can share how that research that you all are doing is helping overall the global marketplace for drones. Sure. Um, so so we're in, in the research end of it, you know, we, uh, I, I have, so Greensight has not actually worked with, with any of the research test sites, but I know that the, the research test sites are providing a great value to, to many companies that, that are, are, are companions in the space that are uh, uh, conducting research to, to improve overall operations. You know, for, for instance, uh, in, in New York, uh, Parazero had, had conducted a lot of research to um, uh, basically prove out their, their uh, parachute system on for their aircraft that is now certified uh, d for approval on uh, DJI aircraft, the, uh, the Phantom and the Mavic 2. Um, and and uh, in that case, there, that has been a, a very clear case about how the, the industry is moving the needle forward here, and it's a, it's just a very exciting uh, thing to be involved in. So, um, so it, uh, on the point about uh, thinking about um, user acceptance or, or, or community acceptance, so the uh, uh, we've had issues where, where we've run at, at a number of golf courses now over the uh, the past four years uh, where there'll be members at different clubs who are have a lot of concerns about why we're doing these operations and uh, and what that has led us to do at, at Greensite is to develop our own um, community outreach to, to basically inform members at, at uh, these places where we're operating at that what we're doing and once they find out that what we're doing is providing a benefit to the 
to the resource that they're using, uh, that it tends to be you know a lot better accepted. So. And, and Jay, if you could maybe expound upon uh, his response by sharing some insights in terms of the test sites, if you have any information on that with, with the audience. Sure. So the test sites are um, independent commercial entities which provide um, a venue where you can go and do research and work out um, safety issues, performance issues, uh, technology issues, and they've been a great advantage. Um, they're all across the U.S. and they have uh, certificates to operate, not just um, in their one locality, but they can also operate um, as public operators across the United States, and they've been a very helpful partner in developing new technologies and sort of helping operators leapfrog into this industry. Um, and they've been great partners in that respect. We also have work that is done in a more uh, university setting through the Assure Center of Excellence that does more of the science side of things, less of the applied operational, but more of the building the body of knowledge. And then, as Melissa mentioned, we have the Integration Pilot Program, which is very focused at getting operations up and running and um, really largely focused on conquering those things that need to be understood, developed, and um, proven safe for beyond visual line of sight operations and ops over people, which are really the two components that unlock the economic and societal benefits of these technologies. Because without those, uh, drones don't scale well from a business standpoint if you have to keep them line of sight. They really scale when you can go beyond visual line of sight. So all of these components are coming together, the test sites, the academic research, and the IPP, and our partnerships for safety, which is similar, and trying to advance these very specific goals. Thank you. And uh, Wayne, you know, when you think about the line of sight challenge as well as maybe the privacy challenges, what are some of the challenges that public safety are seeing with, with the utilization of drones as well as the data that's captured? <clears throat> on some of our challenges, we're starting to realize uh, going beyond the FAA's certification requirements, our own uh, re responder uh, credentialing um, and standards. We, we have it for everything from a firefighter getting on a wildland engine, going to a wildland fire, uh, up to who manages those incidents. We have those credentialing set out. We haven't quite got there. There's a lot of organizations across the nation that are working on it all individually. Uh, we, we need one set standard. Uh, even I'm going to be a part of, or am a part of, um, with Texas doing that for deployment. Uh, what is a drone pilot for deployment in a disaster? So having that, if we can get a standard across the nation, uh, is, is a big component. And data security is, is uh, obviously a, a very important topic right now, one we take very uh, sensitively and, and, and are really um, working hard to address. Um, unfortunately, you know, we, we don't, our users are given by us the choice of what they want done with their data. It's up to them what data they want to share out. And we would like to see a standard uh, national data standard, security standard. Um, you know, we meet every other standard that, 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 and proactively on some, like remote ID. Um, but the goalpost keeps getting moved for us. It's a political thing, especially in a political year. Um, it, we would like to see for the industry, not just our company, but for the industry, a data security standard that, that we would meet and, and it would help uh, like I said, all other manufacturers meet as well. So those are some of our, I feel, our good challenges we have right now that we need to, to, to tackle. Okay. I want to give the audience a heads up that if you have a question or two, uh, feel free to just stand up or wait, raise your hand. So we don't have microphones. The, the podium. Pardon me? Oh, this one right here? Yeah. I wasn't sure you could see him. <coughs>
Urban air mobility. So currently, um, the FAA, in conjunction with other Homeland Defense, Department of Defense, uh, law enforcement, both local and national, are working on a national concept for responding to events, uh, persistent events at airports regarding drones. Uh, there are some specific uh, legal authorities that are granted to agencies for counter, and they're not broadly, only four agencies are permitted to do counter drone deployment throughout the United States. So the way the, the national concept is that uh, TSA will be the first line of defense at an airport and that uh, TSA will be in charge of rallying all of us to respond to the event. Um, I think one of the most important things that that group has brought out is, is a measured response to any event is very important because overreacting could actually cause more safety problems than um, a measured response. So because this is so new, I think everyone's continuing to work all of that out. And you bring up a good question, and we do know we need to engage our partners over at TSA and others on how will the human security side, in particular, work in the urban air mobility model. Um, one area that the FAA has responsibility and um, also in terms of uh, uh, other agencies also have responsibilities in the cyber. And Wayne alluded to it from the, the aspect of data security, which isn't all pure cyber. It's more how do you use the data that um, we've all, we're all sharing. But it does touch cyber. But there's, um, there's a lot of work going on right now in the cyber associated with uh, what would be appropriate for certification, type certification of a drone design certification and manufacturing certification. And there's a growing conversation in the United States about uh, supply chains that are there to support an industry that allows uh, this type of cyber. And, and we also need to be sensitive, as, as Wayne's brought out, not all missions have the same level of sensitivity. And so um, obviously if you're doing a DOD or another very sensitive mission, you may have one set of requirements versus public safety who might have a slightly different set of requirements and we need to keep all of that. So it's an evolving landscape, um, but we're very much tracking it with our um, other agency partners and our industry partners. Mm -hmm. Is there another question? Okay. Oh, in the oh, back. There is. Yes, sir. <laughs> Uh, so there is a legislative requirement for critical infrastructure, and the FAA is currently working with um, the other government agencies who also have a responsibility in defining critical infrastructure across the United States. It does require rulemaking, and um, we have been very focused uh, initially and, and right now on remote identification, but that critical infrastructure is in our rulemaking agenda like it come out next year. So we will see that work um, in terms of rulemaking and meeting the legislative requirement really begin uh, in earnest next year. But there are many voluntary ways that you can meet that. We have the UAS Safety Team, which is an industry organization promoting UAS safety, which has come out with recommendations around geofencing and how uh, that can be done safely and actually DJI was a great help in that work for the UAST and I would I would greatly encourage people to look at those voluntary best practices and start using those as well there you don't need to wait for rulemaking for those things but you could start working on those voluntary compliance as well thank you y yes sir So first, if you have a concern about your privacy or 
Uh, any other, usually local law, you, you should contact your local police department. That is, our, that is your first line of defense against anything that you believe is a violation of a law apart from aviation safety. Second, if you believe there's an aviation safety law that ha or regulation that has been violated, we recommend you call your local flight standards district office and there are plenty of places those are listed on the web um, and we can provide you with that, uh, some links later if you'd like to know that. But that also goes to the core of why remote ID is so important because right now we have no way other than randomly finding that one operator to be able to determine who was that operator, what were they doing, were they flying within compliance of say part 107 or the rules associated with recreational use, did they have the appropriate um, operational approvals for what they were doing and so that that's how remote ID will, will greatly help us, particularly on the enforcement side. Um, we've noticed there is a little bit of a misperception around our notice of proposed rulemaking. Some people think that there's going to be um, personally identifiable information available over remote ID and that's not the case. If you look at the standard that ASTM has produced, which will likely be a means of compliance with the final rule when it comes out, uh, it will be basically the, the license tag, just like you have a license tag on your car, and the location of that license tag and the location of the control station. That's the main information that will be made available. And we think that'll be uh, a great enhancement, both for the general public and for law enforcement and for uh, aviation safety. Long answer. But thank you for allowing me to get remote ID in there. <laughs> well, let me do a follow-up on that. What's the timeline for remote ID? So, uh, the comment period, thank you. We strongly encourage everyone to comment on this uh, notice of proposed rulemaking. Remember, it is a proposal and we are in the public comment period. It ends March 2nd and we strongly encourage you to read the rule, all 300 pages. Um, I've read it. I'm making everyone on my staff, regardless of what their job is, read it. Uh, and then after that, that's the 60 day comment period and depending on how many comments we get and the nature of those comments, it will take us time to adjudicate all of those. But we're highly motivated to get this rule out as soon as possible. The feedback from industry that they gave the Office of Management and Budget who oversees rulemaking for all of the United States was that they can manufacture the aircraft very quickly if we can agree to the rule. So uh, as quickly as possible, we will be moving towards finalizing the rule and um, it depends on how many comments we get. I think the last I saw we had 3,800 comments. Yeah, that's Sweet. quite a lot. Sweet. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Well, that just shows you the nature of the interest and the level of interest there is in this topic. So myself included, there's quite a bit of interest. Let's, let's get this going. So, you know, given that responsibility of remote ID, it takes a lot to put together a program. And Rob, I want to come back to you. you your organization has put on more than 7,000 flights across several countries. Mm -hmm. What does it take to integrate uh, a program, in this case, let's say nationally? What, what would it take to launch a drone program na nationally? Uh, so that, that's a... It's a big question. That's a big question, yeah. Um, so, so what we, we've done is uh, we, we've created our own aircraft and we've created our own program for, for training the operators that, that are using our aircraft at the locations that we operate at. Uh, in, in addition to that, um, you know, we have operated our aircraft in a way such that we are basically we're ready to transition to doing uh, you know, complex operations which are beyond line of sight and unattended operations, but uh, that's kind of hinges upon what Jay just uh, touched on with the remote ID. Um, but it, what we've done to date is that we have had to create a program and, and it's been to some degree through uh, some trial and error, uh, learning how to work with uh, uh, primarily non-aviators. I mean, most of the, our, our customers are golf course superintendents and, uh, and their passion is in turf and not necessarily in drones. And, uh, and so we've had to learn a lot of hard lessons about how to really create a program that's, that's robust enough to take those novice operators and turn them into actual proficient drone pilots for conducting the operations that we run at their properties. 
um, to one of the questions that was brought up earlier was about geofencing. And one of the ways that we've, you know, controlled our own aircraft at these locations is that we have a geofence that we apply to the properties that we operate at. And so those particular aircraft, once they're at a location, cannot be operated anywhere other than the locations that they're designated to be at. Um, so to, to that end, we still, you know, there have been times where, you know, our aircraft are, uh, we, we run low productions. Uh, we haven't, unfortunately, had the, uh, uh, the ability to do the, the extensive, um, you know, research in, in the aircraft development process that a company like DJI will be able to do. Uh, and so we've had issues where we've had incidents at, at, uh, at sites where, you know, an aircraft has an autopilot that, that glitches out or something to that effect. And, uh, um, and, you know, we haven't had any incidents other than, you know, damaged aircraft. But uh, that said, we've, we've each, uh, you know, incident that we've had to take into account, we've had to adjust our training program as uh, necessary to ensure that our operators on the ground can handle whatever situation may come up. Um, so, so we, you know, at Greensight, we're pretty proud about how what we've accomplished in that regard. But it's been a it's been a long road, and, uh, and we've had to learn a lot of hard lessons in, in developing a successful drone program. So, thank you. And Melissa, from a hundred year old organization, I want to say that because you know, again, coming from the insurance industry, you know, State Farm is like one of the monikers and the leaders in this space. What are some of the challenges that you all have faced with launching a drone program and engaging in, in the drone air arena? Yeah, that's a great question. So time to market is always uh, pressing for us. I would have to say the FAA has been a great partner because we both have interest in safety. And so we've been partnering very closely on that was the safest path to implementation for our drone program. For us to accomplish what we want to do next, which is what I would call true BV loss. So we have BV loss and ops over people now, but there are restrictions in place. We want to be able to do more within that vein. We need the technology to get where we need it to be to be able to do that. Um, and I'm speaking specifically about UTM and DAA. So we need that technology to be available, to be tested, proven, and affordable to integrate into our operation. That's great. And in terms of uh, public safety, what's next on the horizon with utilizing drones in the public safety arena? Um, disaster response and uh, hazmat response. Um, Hazardous materials response was something that I, as a chief, was chasing a solution to for a long time. And Romeo has done a lot of great work with Southern Manatee uh, Fire Rescue in Florida, um, a as well as working with FLIR to develop new sensors. Um, and a lot of, I, I, was, I was never a hazmat tech myself in my career. Um, but what I was always understanding was that it would, the, the rotor wash from the aircraft would mess up samples for anything we carried, and they actually proved that to be the opposite. It actually helps. So that was, that I think is a really key because for me, and why I got into it, is anywhere I can send a robot and not a firefighter or a police officer or human, that saves lives. And it goes back to the passive rescues there. And now we can send these in and get that data back. And then the next is integrating into disaster response. Um, Texas has had a lot of disasters as California, um, whether it be wildland fires in Texas or uh, hurricanes or uh, tornadoes. In fact, we have a severe threat coming Friday. Um, integrating in drones into that disaster response has been kind of slow on our state level. Uh, but now we have a new reorganization in the state uh, with uh, emergency management, and they are extremely receptive to drones. In fact, we have uh, the credentialing going on right now to enhance our ability to respond with actual drone teams with our uh, search and rescue teams. So that's great. Thank you. I, I thought I saw a hand. Oh, there we are. Right there. Can you speak up, please? Yeah.
So again, back to a remote identification. If you are not equipped with a remote identification, you would be limited to FAA recognized identification zones. Um, <clears throat> and it then becomes a matter of threat discrimination. So once remote ID is um, not only effective, but we are up to the full compliance rate. If somebody's operating without remote ID around critical infrastructure or outside of a FAA recognized identification area, whoever's looking at that drone knows they are either clueless, careless, or criminal. But they, they, today, we can't make that threat discrimination because just looking at the drone in the sky, we have no idea, is that person compliant, not compliant, you know, um, other than some obvious things if they're flying over people and shouldn't be. But um, that's where remote identification will come in and that's where strong partnerships with public safety and others will become more and more important in terms of mitigating the risk associated with drones and that's specifically why public safety is interested in knowing the location of the control station because they don't need, knowing where the drone is is good but they need to get in contact with that operator and so they'll be looking for that operational station. Um, if that is not available it will now be clear to that local public safety official or a national public safety official or defense or homeland security that this is a drone being operated outside of compliance and they will have a set of protocols to engage that drone. Yes, it was a little difficult to hear you. <laughs> okay, um, so there's other ways that I can employ drones without having an active link to my GCS. Correct. So something to take into consideration moving forward is that I can pre-plant targets through waypoints and fire and forget and, and do whatever I want to do. We would prefer you not pre-plant targets. No, waypoints on a flight plan would be a good thing, but um, Actually, to, to your point, most of the uh, commercial applications use a level of autonomy where they are flying a predetermined flight path and they are adhering to that predetermined flight path. Um, it's true people could use it for malicious reasons, but most of the uses are used for valid operational reasons. But again, um, as we evolve remote ID, as Melissa mentioned, the, the UAS traffic management system is um, based on information sharing. So other actors in that airspace should know what that aircraft is doing so that they can safely avoid it. If that aircraft is not operating under those rules and conditions, it's a known bad actor. And that we're now at a place where we can take action against it. There is always a chance. There's a, there's a chance in manned aviation. There's a chance in surface transportation. There's a chance um, anywhere. It's a matter of what is the risk, what is the threat, and then, you know, do we need to mitigate it? Uh, humans are incredibly creative in finding malicious ways to do things. Um, and we just have to find the balance between the societal good that drones can do and enabling that and then also mitigating the risk of those who don't want to operate in compliance safely and securely. I saw another hand up over here. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, uh, just to this person's point, I know for about, I think it's been about two weeks or so, there's these drones in Colorado to threat to uh, people that are trying to figure out what's going on. With yes, we're very actively involved in that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't mean that as a joke. But, but again, that makes our point about remote ID. If I had remote ID, that local sheriff would have been able to go out there, pick up their mobile phone, that's the way that the interface is envisioned, the API, and they would point it at the sky like they do the Sky Guide app for stars, and it would show you there's the license, the remote ID, the license plate, and then it would give that um, other publicly available, and then, um, Ultimately, as we develop that interface with public safety, they would get the information tied to that aircraft registration and they would be able to contact that individual immediately. 
And if it does turn out it's a commercial operator, they would then subsequently get a visit from our aviation safety inspectors and have a very robust discussion about whether they should be operating or not and what we should do to get them back in compliance. Unfortunately, I'll, we'll never have to have that discussion with any of the operators up here. That's right, that's right. So any speculation of what is going on out in the... Uh, no, oh, no, no, I'm, I'm paid specifically not to speculate. <laughs> What's another way to ask that question? <laughs> yes, sir. We in the FAA wouldn't know about that because our jurisdiction is the airspace. So if it happens indoors or below ground, you're on your own as far as aviation safety. I, I have seen some uh, trade shows where people have drones doing that kind of work. And, yeah, and drones are used extensively in mining. That, that we do know. Yeah, there, there, are, there are a few companies out there that are specifically making drones that are meant to operate uh, in areas that are, have no GPS signals, <laughs> such as mines or caves or that type of thing. So. I've also seen marine use yeah. as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you. Yes, she's referring to the Drone Advisory Council that CompTIA has started, which is fabulous because it's an opportunity for think tank and to come together and help out various constituents such as the FAA and provide a perspective. Thank you. Yes, sir. Gentleman in the back. It was uh, December. 23rd? Yeah, I believe it was December 23rd. Uh, enforcement action is administrative. There are no criminal penalties currently associated with remote identification. There are, but there are other existing criminal penalties associated with aviation and for example, shooting down aircraft and that sort of thing. No. Do you have something special in mind, sir? <laughs> Just kidding. Yes, ma'am. So I'm not the expert to answer the question about commercially what they're understanding about their operation and their business models. Um, but we work constantly with those companies and uh, our biggest joint learning goes back to that community engagement. I mean, when I talk with, for example, Wing, which is one of the 135 carriers operating in Christiansburg, Virginia currently and looking to expand their operation, it is core to their approach to engage that community. They learned that in initial trials in Australia, and they really saw it in Christiansburg, and we see them expanding that. And I think that's one of the biggest learnings. The other one goes back to what Melissa's touched on and what I've touched on is um, the real viability of this technology is unlocked by the scalability that comes with beyond visual line of sight. That's really, until they can get their operations true beyond visual line of sight, we do not unlock the economic viability. And that's the why we as a regulator and we working with industry are so focused on those, those objectives. 
I might add, I'm not in package delivery, but um, through the IPP program, the FAA talks a lot about the crawl, walk, run approach, and that's a big part of what we do in R&D, too. We have to start, and starting by crawling, you know, scope and experiment small, start, learn, and iterate upon that, and that's been very successful for us. So I mentioned with our current waivers, there are restrictions in place, but by starting, we've been able to put in place processes and procedures with our flight ops and we've learned so much in the past year with that and we have been able to increase efficiency efficiencies even within the operation that we do have at, while we're while we work on those larger gains that we want to get to and we with partners like State Farm are incredibly excited when we can safely remove some of those restrictions when we've learned enough and we we call it the crawl walk run we also call it the ops first start with a simple operation, learn from it, expand to a more complex operation. That model works so much better than a traditional bureaucratic, we'll, we'll figure out the rule and then 10 years from now we'll tell you what a good idea is. That does not work for this space. And we've had to grow as an agency tremendously to, to meet this challenge of the pace at which this industry evolves. Let's take for example the UPS medical package delivery uh, that became a part 135 operator. This time last year, they were writing down that concept. They started operating around March. By September, we had figured out how to turn that, we in conjunction, not the FAA, them mostly, but <laughs> we have our role, had figured out how to turn that into a part 135 operation. That is a pace that you do not see in aviation in any other part, right? right? And it's been a huge cultural change for all of us. Um, yeah, in fact, I was You can say, tell I get excited about it. Yeah, that's to the point, my opening statement, that never in history have we seen such a rapid adoption of aviation as we are with the number of drones taken to the sky, as well as the vast uh, in engagement of drones. I mean, I can't imagine from an FAA perspective that uh, four years ago when you launched the commercial drone certification that you were anticipating this level no. of, of interest. No, and, and the integration pilot program has been such a help to adopting this approach that Melissa and I have talked about this operations first, this crawl, rock, walk, run, and has uh, allowed us as a regulator to really come out and meet the operators where they needed us and start working with them to get this industry back on doing our part to stay pace with them. Yeah. Um, I come from, up until very recently, I was on the air traffic system development side. I spent most of my career in the FAA doing that. And to say that you did something in 10 years was, wow, that's about standard. <laughs> to do something in five years, wow, you really humped it. You got something out. I mean, I'm now working in, we're, we're, we're doing new innovations every three to four months. Um, and you get addicted to that level, that pace, and you become very frustrated with the bureaucracy that you've been a part of your whole career. And they start thinking you're a bit snobbish and things. <laughs> Welcome to R&D. <laughs> yeah, yeah, That's it's right. good. Did I, I see another hand? That's a, that's a great question. So to my left is one of the largest manufacturers of drones uh, for recreational and public safety. And they have a standard by which they produce information on their link. But that is their standard. Um, one of the things Remote ID does is standardizes that across everyone. And the other thing, they do this voluntarily as a manufacturer. Remote ID makes the license plate concept standard for all operators. So we, we found it was not good enough to rely on just a manufacturer or a single manufacturer's standard. We needed that harmonization and back to the, um, the title of this panel, we think that's important globally 
as well. And in conversations with our other civil aviation authorities, they have the same view. Um, and we've all been working towards how do we standardize this so that we have common information. And going back to Melissa's comment on the UTM, one of the core principles of the UAS traffic management is that there's information sharing and everyone agrees what that information is and what those formats are. And so that's why we've taken this step of moving down standardizing it all. If we didn't have this level of standardization, we'd never be able to um, uh, identify uniformly across the United States all of the drones, and we would not be putting in place the foundational pieces for the traffic management system that will really allow this sector to grow and, and keep them from having to do traditional air traffic management, which would be clearly overwhelmed by these aircraft. Ah. That's why we're seeking public comment, um, because in the, in the rule, a standard requires both the internet connection and the broadcast. If you read the rule, it says if you're in a location where the internet is, internet is not available, you can begin an operation under broadcast. So that is in the rule. People have misinterpreted that. But we are seeking public comment because we know some people really love the internet and some people really love the broadcast. And we've certainly gotten feedback that people hate both of them together. Um, and so we're, we're working that out with everyone. So I just want to offer a counterpoint to that. So, uh, so while, while DJI has a, a, a lion's share of the, uh, the aircraft that are available out there, uh, we as a, as a private, you know, small uh, UAS manufacturer, uh, we do not broadcast our remote identification um, because there's, there isn't a standard in place. Uh, that said, you know, when there is a standard in place, we're excited to become a part of that. Uh, and, and we're just looking for the, the, the formal guidance to actually make that happen. And I did not pay you for that, correct? <laughs> You're welcome, Jack. Thank you. <laughs> so as we start to wind down, I want to give the three of you a heads up. I'm going to ask you about what's needed in the next two to three years for your business to grow substantially with the drones. But I'll start with, with, uh, with you, Jay, around addressing the issue around testing or sort of, uh, testing certification for recreational pilots. What's coming and what, how soon can we expect it? Ah, uh, so um, to complete our work that was required under the FAA authorization for uh, recreational users, we have to, we have developed a, a knowledge test in conjunction with industry and input public comment on um, recreational users. We've announced that we have a cadre of test administrators and we're currently working with those test administrator, that cadre, to um, figure out how to actually administer and set that, that out there. So very soon you should see the um, cadre of test administrators beginning to offer that test. Okay, great. And so from a two to three year perspective, uh, what would you say is, is needed from a public safety perspective to really leapfrog ahead? Um, I would say it goes back to the standards I mentioned earlier. Um, we're not even just looking I mentioned pilot standards, but we're also, uh, there's a lot of discussion in public safety of pilot rating. Uh, things that we've never envisioned, at least in my career, uh, thinking about, but pilot rating and also aircraft maintaining, uh, aircraft maintainer ratings, um, especially as these systems maybe get more complex or fleets scale up in, in agencies. So, um, Having standards with that uh, is starting to become a, a big discussion in public safety. So consistency in standards for public right, safety. Right, right. Okay, great. Uh, and, and from from our perspective as running a private operation, uh, it, it comes down to being able to grow into the places that, that uh, Jay and Melissa have mentioned here uh, beyond visual line of sight. So uh, we've set up our operation where we can 
we, each operation that we've run, we have two operators involved with the operation. One is the, uh, the, the Part 107 certificated operator on the ground who's maintaining line of sight with the vehicle while it flies. The second is a person who is actually in our office in Boston who is connected to that aircraft and monitoring the health of the aircraft while it flies. Uh, we have that history well documented and we've shared that with the FAA and we have actually uh, been issued a beyond visual line of sight uh, waiver to, to allow us to do operations using where our remote pilot in Boston is the pilot, the designated pilot for the operation for an aircraft that is in a number of different locations around the country. Um, but it, it's still, it, you know, in order to do that operation, it is, it's a BV loss light, as I like to call it, where, you know, we still have somebody on the ground who's maintaining line of sight to, to ensure that the, uh, the airspace is clear. Um, so there is definitely, you know, I, I personally have been tracking a lot of the uh, technologies that have been developing for detect and avoid, uh, and then certainly this remote identification piece and, and the, the, uh, the development of uh, unmanned traffic management. There are a number of uh, operators in the room here that, um, who are familiar with that space, and, and that's, that's, you know, how that all ties together with the remote ID into unmanned traffic management is, uh, is it's just, it's a really interesting thing. And I guess back to Melissa's point, you know, what you mentioned earlier is like, it's like we're on a journey, and it's, uh, it's been, you know, I, I, I've been in this for, for five years now, and it's been a, an incredible journey, and it's been really interesting to see how things have changed and developed over time, and uh, that's it. So it's exciting. So thanks. <clears throat> Alyssa? My wish list is long. I've already mentioned the UTM and DAA to get to true BV loss. I would like remote ops. That's a little bit further out, I think. Um, swarming would be wonderful for what we're trying to do. Um, I would also add federal regulation as much as possible versus state and local because being a nationwide company, that it causes us a lot of extra work to continue to look at state and local ordinances versus being able to operate similarly everywhere we go. So. Well, we're out of time, but I want to give you one last quick second if there's anything else you want to offer up for our audience. I've talked enough. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, panelists for your time today and thank our audience.